In this video, I want to walk you through some of the exercises that relate to chapter sections 2-1 and 2-2. So the first one is when an airplane starts its propellers, those propellers will spin very slowly at first and gradually they will pick up speed. Why does it take so long for them to, to reach their full rotational speed? Well, first, let's look at those two fundamental relationships. F is equal to MA, that was for translational, that's force is equal to mass times acceleration. And then the same thing we had for rotational relationships was torque is equal to moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So let's look first at this relationship, the translational one, just because it's a little easier to see. Now look, if I have a great big mass, m and I want it to accelerate. Can you see that if I if this is a really big number, like let's say this is 100 kilograms and I want it to accelerate to eh, let's call it 1 meter per second per second. Well, 100 times 1 meters per second per second, I'm clearly going to have to apply 100 newtons on this side to get this 100 kilograms to accelerate. So F is equal to 100 newtons to get this mass of 100 kilograms to accelerate 1, oops, 1 meter Per second per second. Now, can you see the bigger this mass, the more force I will have to exert to get it to accelerate to any given number, right? Bigger mass, and that makes sense. I mean, I just have to push harder if this mass is bigger if I want to get it to accelerate at all. So, when we're looking at um, rotational sorts of issues, it's the same idea. For this one, let's say that I'm looking down on a bowling ball. So here's this bowling ball. I'm looking down right on it, and I just want to get it to start turning. Well, it's I, I want it to accelerate at some rate, right? So let's say that I wanted it to accelerate at one radian per second per second. You know, so remember that's like 57 degrees per second per second. That's how I'm trying to get it to accelerate. And then the torque, let's say that I had a moment of inertia here of 100 kilogram meter squared. Because remember that has um, this moment of inertia relates to both the kilograms, the mass of it, and also the area, right? Because if it's if it's broader, it'll be a little bit harder to get it to accelerate. So I would need, in this case, if this was 100 kilogram meter second per second, or sorry, 100 kilogram meter squared, and I want it to accelerate at this rate, which is essentially one, then I'd have to put a torque on this of 100 newton meters. Now, you can, you can get a sense here that if I increased this moment of inertia, if I made this into a bigger bowling ball, in other words, I would have to increase the amount of torque if I wanted it to, um, to get to the same acceleration, right? If this moment of inertia is bigger, I'll have to increase the torque to, to get it to accelerate at the same rate, right? So the bigger the bowling ball, the bigger its moment of inertia, and the more force I have to apply. Well, for a propeller, the moment of inertia is, well, those darn guys are 
awful heavy. They have really huge blades and they can weigh hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And see how they, they go way out? So their geometric factor is quite large too. So to get these puppies to start accelerating, it takes quite a, a bit of time because they have a big moment of inertia here. And for them to get all the way up to accelerate, all the way up to their full velocity, is going to take quite a, a bit of um, time because they just have such a large moment of inertia. So there you go. That's the explanation for problem two, or excuse me, exercise two. Now let's talk about this number four. I like this particular problem because it's actually, it's so easy, but it isn't obvious when you first look at it. It says, an object's center of mass isn't always inside the object, as you can see by spinning it. Where is the center of mass of a boomerang or a horseshoe? Well, let's, what is the center of mass? Center of mass means, um, essentially, if you had a, like a point, oh, that's kind of a lopsided point right there, and you balanced whatever you had on this point, where would the the weight be so distributed that it would balance because the weight on this side pulling it down would be pretty much the same as the weight on that side as the weight so it would be right around it doesn't necessarily have to be precisely in the geometric middle of of your object but in fact let's let's look at this if we have something like a horseshoe Here's our horseshoe. It turns out that right about this point right here, there's there's equal amount of mass on this side and on this side, as well as there's an equal amount of mass on that side as well as that side. So it's balanced right here in the middle of the horseshoe where there is nothing at all. But that's okay. That's just where the center of mass is. We've got the same balancing amount of mass on each side, even if we don't happen to have a mass right there in the middle. That would be the same if we had something like a boomerang. Look at this. If we, um, the boomerang's center of mass would be something like right here, right? We've got s the same amount of mass on the right as on the left, and then it would uh, likewise, uh, if we flip it and rotated it around, um, there's the same amount of mass above it here as there is below it. And so the center of mass is outside of the boomerang. Now, what you'll see is um, the manufacture of a bowling ball. And bowling balls, as it turns out, have their center of mass a little bit off center. And the reason for that is so that they can hook. So you're going to see that right now with your with the video. Let's roll. Bowling is a sport that's been played in different cultures for thousands of years. Anthropologists have even found an early version of a ball in pins in the grave of an Egyptian boy buried more than 5,000 years ago. One of the most popular modern variations is 10 pin bowling and its traditional home is here in the USA. The production process begins with the central core, made with this resin mixture. The mix is poured into the molds and left to set. When they're removed, each core must weigh exactly 4.85 kilos, or 10.7 US pounds. No more, no less. Now, although the core is mostly resin, there are two additional important pieces inside. A sphere of metal seen here gives the bowling ball mass. Another piece placed off center seen here in gold helps professional bowlers to curve their shots. The ideal shot in bowling is not a dead straight one. A curved shot has a higher chance of knocking all 10 pins over in one go. This is the coveted strike, the best shot in bowling. The cores are now washed with special stones. 
This helps to key or dent the surface so it will bond tightly with the resin exterior. This exterior is the next part to be added. Each core is carefully placed in a new mold. Each mold holds the core dead center so that there is an even distribution of the surface material all the way around it. The core and mold will then be passed along the line to be coated. The coating is a polyurethane mix that traditionally is quite colourful. But in a slightly bizarre trend, some bowlers also want their balls to have an individual smell. Variations include cinnamon apple, lemon and even amaretto. The colourful polyurethane is pumped into the moulds, but different bowling balls have different weights. To make a new ball heavier, workers simply add a higher concentration of the polyurethane mix. The cores are all exactly the same weight. By varying concentrations of the covering mixture, a range of balls can be produced with different sizes and weights. Any excess on the coating is blasted away with air guns and the whole thing is passed along so the moulds can be mechanically removed. The ball will now join the queue to be cut down to size. Each year this factory produces half a million bowling balls this way. Now all the moulding and rolling has left our new ball rather rough around the edges. This next machine grinds the ball into shape without removing too much material. With the shape just right, it's time for the cosmetic finishing touches. Here the logo is being engraved. And to add a final splash of extra colour, the ground out areas are filled with coloured paste. Estimates suggest that over 40 million people bowl on a regular basis worldwide. And high demand plus a company image to maintain means the look is just as important as the quality. The next phase is the polishing. Each ball is placed in one of these cups and the polishing rollers get to work. And finally, they're ready to go bowling. Well, not quite. Without the vital finger holes, gripping these balls would be impossible. Using a specific measuring device, exact spots are marked out where finger holes need to be drilled. This drilling is done in an automated process. While the debris is vacuumed up, the depth of the holes is gauged to make sure it's just right. And finally, the ball is ready to go. It's wrapped in plastic packaging to protect the shiny surface for the customer, and then it's boxed up. For the professional who knows his game, a quality bowling ball is a must to make those all-important strikes needed to become a 10-pin king. Okay, now let's look at problem number three. Here they say a mechanic balances the wheels of your car to make sure that their centers of mass are located exactly at their geometric centers. Neglecting uh, friction and air resistance, how would an improperly balanced wheel behave if it were rotating all by itself? Well, here's how to look at that. Okay, so we've got a wheel. Now, geometric center should be about here. 
Now let's say, whoops, should be about there if I can get that there. Let's say that one of your tires, you, you stopped very suddenly. And so you shaved off a little bit, right? Friction took off and made it a little bit bald on this side. So if I if I try to I'm gonna I'm gonna try and draw the tire and illustrate well let's that's gonna be the ball part and the rest of it has thicker rubber. That's what I'm gonna try and show right here. Okay, so we got thicker rubber here. Okay, so you see it's a little thicker here uh, on the to the upper right. So the actual center of mass here is more like at that location, right? That I'm showing in red, because now there's there's about an equal amount on this side as there is on this side of you know it's a little bit off center. So how this tire would like to rotate is it would like to rotate around the center of mass, right? But it's it's lined up, it's built to rotate around its geometric center. And so the difference between those two can make it so that the center of mass is off, offset and it, and it can create problems. So you're going to see that now with um, a washing machine load and with tire balancing. Okay, I'm Tim Gibson and I'm going to talk to you about how to balance a washing machine tub. Now, most of your common, your your modern washing machines uh, are equipped with a motor that actually runs at a variable speed and possibly in variable directions. Uh, for instance, uh, with this particular model, it's a front-loading machine. So as it goes through its wash cycle and as it goes through its rinse cycle, with the clothes that are in there, the tub will actually rotate in opposite directions. Now, part of this is to distribute the water and use less water and, and to uh, rinse the clothes, but part of that process is it does it at different directions and at different speeds to redistribute the clothing that's in there to help it balance out. So really with uh, most of your modern washing appliances, uh, a lot of that balancing takes place automatically. Now, the the tubs on these washing machines come with little weights, counterweights, that are uh, attached to them to balance them out. So they're balanced as, at the factory. So if you do have a lot of banging and if it's happening a lot, now it could be just with a particular load that you're doing. So if you're doing some heavy loads such as towels, such as a lot of jeans, uh, occasionally you may have to go in there and you, they may get tangled up and clumped together. So you may have to go in there and physically uh, break them apart and redistribute the load manually. And now if that's happening a lot or if you're hearing loud banging or clanking, you may have a weight that has come loose or you may have a problem with the motor drive on that. In those cases, you probably want to consult a professional uh, repair service uh, to have those problems looked at. You really need to have your tires balanced, but not like this, of course. Today I'm going to talk about some real tips for balancing your tires. And I'd like to start with explaining the difference between a wheel alignment and tire balancing because they're frequently confused. A wheel alignment involves putting your car on a machine such as this and making adjustments to the steering and suspension on the car until the wheels are perfectly lined up. Balancing your tires is not a part of a standard wheel alignment. Now we can talk about balancing your tires and why is it important? Well, you're going to have your tires wear out sooner rather than later if they're out of balance. Your tires will hop as you're going down the road or even wobble side to side if they're out of balance, and that's going to wear them out much quicker. So how do you know if they're out of balance? One good way to realize they are is if you're driving down the road, especially at high speeds, and you get a shimmy from the steering wheel such as this, 
that's going to tell you that the tires are out of balance and probably the front tires. Now on the other hand, if you're feeling the wobble or the shimmy in the seat, that usually means that it's a back tire that's out of balance. But either way, if you get a shimmy such as that, you need to get your car in and get it checked out. Here's why tires need to be balanced. Whenever an object spins around in a circle, it will have a tendency to wobble if one side is heavier than the other, kind of like a ceiling fan. Same holds true for a tire. The weight of the tire and wheel must be evenly distributed to keep it from wobbling at higher speeds. When a tire is balanced, it's put on a machine such as this, which spins it up to speed. Then sensors in the machine take readings as the tire spins and gives the technician a readout of how much weight the wheel needs in order to be balanced. Even as little as a quarter of an ounce of weight can make a big difference. Once the weights are installed, the technician runs the machine again to verify that the wheel and tire are perfectly balanced. There are different type of weights and they fit different types of wheels. So your mechanic should be using the type of weight that's designed for your particular wheel. Otherwise, not only will they not look good, but they might fall off down the road and then your wheel is out of balance once again. So if you have a shimmy out on the road, get it in right away, get your tires balanced and you should be good to go. For Channel 6 News, I'm Jim Champion, the Auto Guy. Okay, now, why is it hard to start the wheel of a roulette wheel spinning and what keeps it spinning once it's started? Well, this is just like that uh, airplane uh, propeller. The wheel, the wheel has rotational inertia. And that um, makes it hard to stop, makes it hard to stop and to start start and stop spinning. So no magic to that answer. It, it just is pretty much like the the um, airplane propeller. Now why can't you open a door by pushing its door the doorknob um, directly toward or away from its hinges? So let's see if we can draw what this what I'm trying to do right here. Okay we have um, a door knob or a door. This is going to be our door right here. And let's see. So um, we we've got the door. Here's the hinges on it. And here's this little door knob. And we're what they're saying is, how come you can't open the door? by just pushing directly against you know in this line with the door why can't you open it and of course we know that to actually open a door what you have to do is kind of I'm trying to push uh, perpendicular to this plane right here and that is what pushes it open why can't you push directly towards it well for one thing if you try it you know it just won't work and, but the other reason is when you're opening a door this to some extent this is like that R remember the torque is equal to the radial arm times the perpendicular force this right here indicates the perpendicular force right this distance right here is the radial arm so if you push perpendicular it opens if you push this way guess what the perpendicular force there isn't any because this is all parallel force so this force is zero so of course it doesn't open now they also ask you why can't you open a door by pushing on its hinged side so they're basically saying if you went over to the hinges and pushed right here how come it won't open well in that case it's the same equation I can be exerting something that's sort of a perpendicular force, right? But the radial arm is zero. In fact, if I try and push a door open, well, unless you're pushing against the frame of the door, um, in which case it just won't work, it, whichever way you do it. But let's say you try pushing, normally you would push right here. But let's say that instead of pushing right there, you're pushing right here in blue closer to the hinges 
it's going to be harder to push open. Why? Because the radial arm is shorter, so you don't exert as much um, torque. When you exert it right here on the hinge, where the hinges are themselves, right in that, that same axis, well, this R is zero. There's no radial arm at all. So it's no surprise that the torque you exert is zero and the door won't open. So now let's look. It says one way to crack open a walnut is to put it in a hinge side of a door and then begin to close the door. Why does a small force on the door exert a large force on the shell? Well, in this regard, I have to bring back an old story. Here's, here's a picture. Okay, this is from when I used to work on Soviet trawlers. So that's me. I'm looking really cold. Uh, I'm bringing this over here. Okay, I'm going to show you a picture of my husband. Okay, there you see my husband right there. This is after him being outside for 10 minutes. Look at this. He he, he doesn't even look cold, right? It's, it's like minus uh, 70 degrees and he doesn't even look cold. And the thing is for me though, I always look cold. So there I am standing there on the Bering Sea looking really cold. Now what does this have to do with a door opening? Well we used to have these really heavy heavy hatch doors that looked a lot like these kinds of doors. And I'm guessing these way doors would weigh, I don't know, somewhere on the order of four or five hundred pounds each. They were hard to shut, right? You really had to swing to get them closed. and one thing about these doors is that, well, I'm going to draw, let's pretend you're looking down and right down in this line, the door swings like this. So the hinges are down on this line. This is the door. And let's say here's the frame right in here. So there's a little bit of a frame there. There's a frame over here. All of this was to make it so that when they closed the door, you could really hatch it down and get a tight seal in case you had really heavy seas and it would help prevent things flowing, water flowing in from where it wasn't supposed to be flowing in. So we had this one guy, um, he was an American, he was visiting, and he was standing in the threshold of this door and he happened to put his hand with his thumb right in. Let me draw that. You can see what's going to happen here, don't can't you? Okay, so he had his thumb right there, his hand here. There's his, you know, he was kind of leaning and standing right there. And so we're looking down at his head. So sure enough, you can see what happened. We had heavy seas. He's standing there with his hand right there. Now Russians, you should know that fishermen are incredibly superstitious everywhere and a big Russian superstition is you never stand in in a doorway so he was this American was standing in the doorway we all saw him there and we, at the same time we all yelled at him get out of the doorway so he went to move out just as this door somehow disconnected from the hinge that was holding or from the uh, the stopper that was holding it open cuz the seas were really bad and it started to slam shut and uh he went to jump out but not quickly enough and it caught his thumb right in that door now let's imagine what was actually going on what kind of force his thumb was experiencing now we know that let's let's call let's say that let's say that our door is was pushing okay what what was happening was this door was falling closed because um the sea was such that our 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 boat was kind of going way down vertically there's our boat like that so on a big wave so here the door was um was open and it would have been swinging so it's like it would have been sideways and then it would have been you know kind of like that 
and then it would have been swinging down and closed. So we can, okay, so you're on, you're seeing that angle now. Now we're looking at it again. So look at this. Here's our, here's where the hinges are. We're looking straight down on the top hatch of this door and it's, it's roaring closed towards this guy. Let's say that it's something like 100 pounds of force. It was actually probably more than that when you average everything. But let's just for the sake of argument say it's slamming down, roaring closed towards here at 100 pounds at this point right here. That's about the equivalent of 500 newtons. Okay, so it's slamming 500 newtons. Let's call it that this this door is one meter wide. Okay, so if that's one meter wide and 500 newtons, so the amount of torque that he was experiencing or, or that this door was experiencing was 500 newtons times one meter is 500 newton meters of torque. So there we go, that's, that's how much torque. Okay. So now think, here's the key part, okay, that's what's, okay, we're, there we go, that's what's happening, we're getting that much torque exerted overall. So a force of 100 pounds pushing this way and uh, at one meter out. Now, when his thumb is sitting right there, it's, it's going to push back, right? So his thumb is going to push back against this door. The, the torque being experienced at this point is the same as the torque at that point. So let's see what, this, what that tells us. If the torque is the, at this point has got to be torque is equal to 500 Newton meters. So his thumb is going to experience pressure on, or a force on it and his thumb is you know let's call it this whole radial arm is one meter but let's call this we're going to call this maybe oh point oh one meter I mean around a centimeter it's right close to the hinge on that door so it's one one hundredth of this whole distance so that torque being experienced, which is 500 Newton meters, is equal to 0 0.01, which is the short R short, times the force that his thumb is exerting backwards. Let me redraw this for you so that you can see a little more clearly. So uh, that, that was very unpleasant. So as it turned out, um, the word, so he, he went to my captain and uh, wrote a telegraph so that we were going to call in the um, Coast Guard to rescue him because his thumb got all infected. And um, it turned out that, that my captain saw his telegraph message and turned white because it turned out that the word thumb was the one that meant that the entire U.S. Navy should be called in because this marine fisheries observer was in real dire straits. And uh, so my captain turned all pale and said, no, no, don't use the word thumb. So we had to substitute a word for his thumb and we told them all about it and they came and got him. And last I saw, Russians, of course, were trying to make sure that he was in no pain, so they had him uh, ensconced in vats of vodka, and he um, ended up falling into the ocean before they could haul him out, and I never saw him again, but he was very happy as he took off. Anyway, that's my story to talk about uh, the, the basic ideas of torque and how torque can be used even in things like how you can crack open a walnut shell. The walnut shell is exactly the same idea. You put a walnut right in here and you can exert a force, a small force here, and get a much bigger force 
that's exerted right here that's balanced by the um, the walnut itself and that's how you can crack the walnut or a thumb depending on what you want to crack okay so this is the same idea when it when we're talking about a pair of pliers they have let's see I'm going to I'm gonna draw something here this is like a pair of scissors or, or a pair of pliers or what have you we can exert a force way out here and as long as we stick something in close right in here look the torque which is the force the perpendicular force times this radial arm right and it's a little hard to draw here but let me try again I'll just draw in black okay this between here and here that's your length of your radial arm on this side and on this side you have the same sort of thing you've got a shorter radial arm right there's your shorter radial arm we'll call that R2 the other one let's call that R1 F1 so there's here's our F1 and our R1 and here we're going to have a short R2 and let's put this it's going to exert a force that's opposed exactly by a piece of paper or whatever you've got in your your pliers or your scissors and this opposing force so that force so force the opposing force of uh, F2 times R2 so that's essentially the torque going this way is balanced by the torque on the left going that way these two torques balance one another okay so if we have F1 R1 is equal to F perpendicular to R2 and this R2 is really short and this one is long we can exert a small force out here and have it be multiplied by this long R and get a mechanical advantage so that we have a much bigger force exerted at the far end right in on the the far end of the scissors let's try this out if we exert a force of 100 newtons say right on the far end of our scissors and let's call it let's say we have a big long pair of scissors right there and that's actually one meter long okay it's really big the call them those are the ribbon cutting scissors you know for ceremonial purposes and let's say that we have um, we're gonna have some interior force being experienced I'm gonna I'm gonna draw okay let's say we stick our little piece of paper in on the right so this is supposed to be a piece of paper piece of paper okay what's gonna happen is it's gonna it is gonna exert a force that is balanced precisely by the force um, on the scissors it's exerted you know because we're pushing on the scissors up here so they're gonna bound these two forces are gonna balance one another as long as they can and then until this force is actually so big that it it um, cuts through the paper and so that of course is the purpose of scissors or you know pliers maybe um, or wire cutters or something like that we can we can cut a piece of wire so uh, how does it do that it multiplies the force so if as long as this R is really short let's say that instead of one meter like it is on this side we'll call it you know 0.1 meter it's one tenth it's so that's actually ten centimeter 
uh, 10 centimeters. That's pretty long right there, but we'll just put that in there for um, because it makes it easy to calculate. So if this is a lot shorter, then I, I can calculate what this force that's being experienced on this side by simply dividing point 0.1, divide by point 0.1, then this F perpendicular on the right hand side is going to be a hundred times greater. So it will actually be a thousand newtons experienced by the right hand side. That's the mechanical advantage. That's the, the multiplying effect that we have uh, because the torques must balance, but if we're uh, playing games by having a shorter radial arm on one side versus another, that will allow us to, to uh, multiply our force.